welcome everyone um, to the third episode of the Filmworks Classroom. Um, as you've probably been bothered by Gus and my ramblings, you can see that first of all, I'm here. So John, the marketing manager at Filmworks and uh, Gustavo Mendez, our product manager and the man of the hour, Bjorn Lance, our uh, customer success specialist and overall tech guru uh, who knows pretty much everything about Filmworks. So today we're going to be going through uh, how to set up a project on Phoenix and use DVO frame lock. Firstly, to show us how to align footage to the original framing for automatic stabilization and remove the effects of analog duplication. So perfect for anyone who is translating real film into the digital space and doesn't want it jumping around everywhere. You can now get frame lock uh, in a variety of different ways from Phoenix Film and Phoenix Ultimate packages all the way to going to our upgrade packs for DVO Restore uh, and DVO, the DVO Film Pack. And you can check that out all on our website, uh, but more from that a bit later. Without further ado, I will stop talking and hand it over to the man of the hour. And Bjorn, take it away. All right. Uh, how I'm not the man of the hour, press. You need to I change the screen, we... first of all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going there. If you say an hour, I kind of take some time, but I was hoping <laughs> to do a quick presentation. Uh, so I, I will try to share a screen over here. And uh, let me see. Entire screen and share. And we should be able to. Boom. Hopefully see something. And look at that, this lovely compression. But there we go. Uh, hopefully it gets better and you, you will be able to see something. So what I will quickly do is just fire up the Phoenix and uh, uh, start having a look. What we're going to have a look on today, which is the DVO frame lock. And uh, to do that, uh, I'm going to... You see I have a few output formats. Uh, I'm just going to make a classroom let's call it take two because we had a early morning session as well or morning session for some or afternoon session for even the, the guys in asia uh, but i just create a new project and i will open that one up <clears throat> so i do have some footage um, and i'm just gonna bring in an edl to, to kind of get it on the timeline and as you see there, there are some different kind of footage in here uh, if I just do fit so you have three sections the, the first section uh, a second and a third so they, they're a little bit spread out in terms of times uh, so uh, time when we're generated so uh, the first one we're gonna look on uh, is some content I got from real um, and uh, it's the Dorian Weber collection. Uh, this was actually shot in 2001, so it's fairly new. And if you look on it, uh, hope we will see, um, especially if I try to maybe zoom up a little bit on this one, so we can see slightly more. That, that you see there, some slight jitter and it's jumping up and down a bit, but it is kind of perfect uh, for frame lock because you have the whole framing. There's no sprocket, but we don't need it uh, because we're gonna lock upon the framing itself. Um, frame lock is uh, a clever tool. Uh, it does exactly what you do tell it to do. So applying it, I don't have to do anything because it will automatically find uh, where these kind of stuff uh, lies and. If I here, you can see I have something called clear and I can then select that one and it will show me uh, the edges, where it's actually going to look for. So it finds these automatically. Um, and if you now play this, we will notice that uh, we have a solid image again. Now, right there, I could have ended the session because uh, that's what it does. It stabilizes it. but. Uh, I had to struggle a bit and find these clips which actually had issues with it so uh, it, it might not work the, the whole time uh, and for obvious reasons. Uh, so we can look on this one. So the first clip actually have a nasty problem because if I step here uh, forward a few frames we see something happening. It's a gigantic flare and as you see the whole image 
shifts to the left. Um, so what to do if this happens? So um, I could probably try setting things up, but as it's just this flare uh, at this position, uh, I can see these two corners are pretty good. So we had something that we have lock focus, uh, and that is something that the tools itself find where to lock on, onto this. Uh, but in this case, I can give it a hint uh, to uh, tell it, look on the corners uh, on, on the left hand side. And as I do that, you see it immediately pops into position and, and the uh, clip is now just nice and stable. We can probably see if, if we have an, uh, let me drop this one down and move it here so we can see that it just physically fixed this one but the original wall uh, is jumping uh, as crazy so not too hard um, but still it's there so um, I just hit fit so I'm gonna jump to the next one uh, what we're gonna see here is some content I used before but it's beautiful content it's from morning of the earth uh, it was uh, first screened that 1972. It's an Albert Falson uh, who did the shooting and also uh, all, all the things did it. And uh, Origins Archival, uh, they did a 4K restoration of this, scan, rescanning all the 16K and uh, the, uh, that one. Another good reason to watch it is the the, uh, the music in it is all wonderful. But if you want to look more into it, you can always go into morningofthearth.com and uh, you, you can get more information about it there. Uh, but what is it? Uh, it's a surfing movie. And uh, now the grades, it's not graded as you can see, uh, but the grades in, in, the, in the final result are really nice. But what we have, we have something that is very much jittery. You can see it jitters, but uh, even though the sprockets are pretty stable, uh, it really, really uh, jumps around. So basically here I go frame lock, apply it and as I do that uh, we can see up here uh, as I play that it just locks upon it and all this jitter is uh, really really just gone. Um, so uh, if I'm happy with it I didn't have to do anything um, and we can see of course in the inside frame that it yeah, it finds everything as it should. Uh, so for me, it's more or less, I can, can go to the next scene, lasso in the mall, go into my events viewer, and just take the setting and uh, let me see, it should be in here, the input effects, yes. And recall it onto all these clips. And well, as I, and now everything is good, but of course it's not because I promised you that we're gonna have some problems somewhere. But as, as you see uh, with these uh, kind of, uh, if I just fit it, um, since it's just rock, rock solid and so on. But there is one scene um, uh, and we can actually see it. Everything looks nice. Um, but in the beginning of this shot, it's a fade from black and as you see there are no framing there and the next frame also what we can see it doesn't have any framing in the back you can sort of notice that there are some framing and then we can hit um, where it actually stabilized and you can see that it's rock solid but the two first frames are not really there because there isn't enough data uh, to sort of do anything with it um, so what to do? Uh, one way you can do it is in the frame lock, use the manual adjust. And to do that, I simply turn on my key framing. So I do one, two, three key frames. And uh, I'm gonna use another playhead as well. I'm just gonna take this one, the second one, and I'm gonna jump uh, back here so I have the same here and just place it 
on the timeline so i know the same scene so if i now play my a head uh, we can see and if i also compare it with the b head we can see that that it's aligned uh, but as i go back we can see on this one that it actually isn't aligned because it couldn't fix it in this case but with the manual adjust all i need to do is pull this one up and i wonder how much i need to pull it okay all right something like that i assume it's okay yeah maybe a little bit further up yeah something like that so now i know that one aligned i can go to the first frame as well i shouldn't bother because it's just black but if i look where the splice is it's actually just at the framing so I, what i will do I, I will just push this one up a bit as well make sure um, that i don't go too far here so i know when i do the final movie it's it's gonna be aligned nicely and if i just play it now uh, we can see uh, that it's nice and stable if we play it and if i compare it with the source as well it might be easier um, so you see that, that that's all nice and as we go on uh, we have different scenes and you see how nice it just aligns uh, to the original uh, camera framing so um, seeing that we can now move into the next one now we're going further back uh, <laughs> this is a tricky one uh, Oh, man. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's like it's a Finnish movie uh, made in 1954 so probably shot actually 70 years ago because you do all the shooting in summertime in Finland and in Sweden because it's then when we have the light uh, it's no fun shooting uh, in Sweden or Finland in winter time because it's very very dark definitely a mouthful uh, of a title there though <laughs> it is it is so and apologies for pronunciation so um i'm just gonna switch this to 4k uh right now so here we go we have the title i'll turn off that one as well so so it, it's a nice 4k scan and um, and we can see you have a few things but as promised there are some issues um so if i apply frame lock on this one you can see it it looks stable and nice um if i play it almost at least it looks a bit jerky i think i know the reason and that's probably because um i import an edl and that doesn't automatically turn on uh, um, that that it, it makes a, a scene edit rather than a uh, scene cut so if i just do uh, I will just lasso in them all. I hopefully this will help and toggle it to become scene edits, uh, and then it's nicely slips into place. And, and we can see it looks nice and stable. But uh, if you look onto uh, what I mentioned before, this inside frame, we'll notice that it looks nicely uh, on most part of it. But in the bottom here, we can see that it actually aligned to something in like some black blanking here and uh, normally uh, with a sm sm smart draw it shouldn't be an issue because we should detect that uh, it it's digital blanking but if we look more closely onto this one uh, we probably notice um, if i just uh, put some colors into it and black maybe yeah there are some jitter or something maybe it gets worse or better but there are something so uh, in this case uh, uh, we have an issue that it locks upon the wrong uh, area uh, of um, the one so what i can do is of course i can change my region of interest uh, up here and then everything goes nicely or i can tell it um, if i go back here uh, let me see we have the smart roy which is the one that you detected but it's on safe mode uh, if i tell it to be bold um, then it will sort of okay yeah uh, 
I'm pretty sure that this is digital blanking of some kind uh, and it will find the correct areas. Um, so now we will have something nice running. And yeah, so if we do just split here as well with source. We can see how it really aligns it up nicely. Now it suddenly jumps into the next scene. And just to save speed up the end of the show, I actually made a down rest of the rest one to half resolution. It's gonna, it's gonna work in 2K instead. But uh, as this one worked, I can now, uh, in this case, uh, again, well, let's just save a note instead for seeing another way to how to recall things. So I'm just gonna, oh, should be on the correct spot then. Uh, save a note. And then I can select my frame lock and recall it onto these. And of course, once I've done that, uh, we should see that. Uh, sorry again, let's not see it versus the note, but versus the source. We can see that we get a nice and stable shot, uh, even though there's panning and everything. Uh, you, you get the nice uh, one anyway. So even on this one, uh, and now I come to a problematic shot. Okay, uh, why is this one problematic? Uh, uh, let me just turn into clip mode. And if I just play it, you can see it jump suddenly. And let me just do quickly like this as well. Uh, just gonna tell it to be uh, scene edit there. And as, as I play this, you can see it jumps occasionally. Um, and, and if you look here, if I just stop here in the middle somewhere, turn off that split so we can see what's going on, is if I go my inside frame, it looks pretty good for some reason. Um, oh no, there it jumps. Hold on, didn't I turn on? Um, ah, maybe I need to do it like this. Okay, sorry, I uh, had it all set up cor incorrectly. So what we see, um, is that it kind of locks to this signage rather than what it is. And, uh, and it can be an issue as uh, when, when they do this like really nice uh, going from one scene from another, they are not identical. Uh, so in this case, uh, it sort of finds this uh, signage because it's very black and so on at some point. So. Uh, so you get this jump on this, you can see they're not even aligned uh, in, in, in the top. So it makes a jump. So so if you look now on the inside frame, you uh, know uh, that the problems are down here. So what I just do is tell it to ignore the bottom, uh, exclude it. And once I've done that, um, we can then see that uh, our stabilization looks good and it does whatever it needs to do um, and i have a final one uh, to show you as well here's another one and uh, as you notice uh, there are two different uh, film statuses an a and a b but but they're not aligned uh, so uh, basically uh, let me just if we see this one, I'll just do, uh, let me see, I want to have that. Oh, no, 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 control Z. Make it the proper scene cut uh, also here and here. Uh, the reason why I have to do this is I have more footage and it's it gonna try to use the handles if I don't set this one up. Uh, but as we can see, uh it's not really 
super stable. And if you look uh, on my frame lock on the inside frame, uh, it tries to lock somewhere here, but they are different both uh, in upper and downer part of the image. Also on this side, we don't really have any uh, framing. It's actually on only on the left hand side, we can have something. So in this case, uh, what we should do uh, for easy uh, thing is just turn off bottom, right and top. Tell it to uh, target over right and use um, uh, left hand side. And we should now see uh, if I just do a split with the source and if everything works as I wanted to do, uh, we will get something that actually just stabilize it uh, by just using one single frame side of, of the framing. So there is a lot of things in here uh, that you can. There are things for exclude per scene. So if you have like bad splices, you can uh, automatically uh, try to find if it's bad. But if you know it's bad and it really doesn't work, you can force it to ignore the top at the beginning or in the end. Um, there are things for if the image are very noisy or if you have like vertical scratches on the side. Uh, you can add tools to sort of clean up the analyzed picture to, uh, uh, to, to make it work better. Safety is also very good to use. Uh, I didn't have to use it on this one, but usually if it's almost there, you usually just lower safety because we always uh, like to be very safe when we do things uh, and then everything would work nice and uh, so on. And uh, also, we have mute on unsafe of offset X and Y. And that means if you get a very big jump in, in the image, uh, we can tell it don't process that frame because that is uh, just uh, silly. You must have done something wrong. So leave it as it was. So that was a little bit uh, from this one. And uh, gonna turn back to John and let him drive the things over. And my hour is done. <laughs> that is a very quick hour. That was a quick hour. Uh, well, thank you so much, Bjorn, for going through that. That was a load to take in, which is incredible. Um, and now I want to open up the floor to any questions. Um, I mean, there is a, just to say, there is, I think, a bit of an issue on our tech end to actually looking at questions right now, so there might be a bit of delay. Uh, but I would like to start off with a question uh, from my end. Um, are there any other tools you would use in tandem with DVO frame lock in order to achieve that still look? Yeah, well, you can use other. Uh, normally it just does it. You don't have to worry. But uh, like uh, I showed you in the last scene where I just could use one side. So if I want to have a look a little bit, uh, taking down the movement up and down a bit if needed, mm -hmm. uh, I, I could add like DVO steady for it and then just maybe use that one in Y direction and not the next direction. So to sort of smooth that motion down, mm -hmm. uh, you can use uh, a tool like uh, the normal tracker. Uh, if you most want to have part of the image uh, stabilized and like the fo focal point and, uh, uh, and then just run it in a pan and scan to sort of uh, mm -hmm. get that thing steady. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Daniel's mentioned that this is a Technically, it's a Swedish hour, uh, so half the time there. Um, but I don't uh, Gus, do you have any questions on that? Because I think it was a very explanatory classroom there. Todd, it was incredible. Bjorn, as usual, on point, man. It was pretty great. Real Well, uh, I don't think there's any more questions from the class here. Um, so jumping over. So yeah, just as an overall summary uh, of DVO frame lock, it is designed to align your footage to the original framing rather than the sprockets, providing you an automated and accurate stabilization. And it will remove the effects of analog duplication or weaving and, and hold your footage in place, keeping it locked and steady where the way the cameraman intended it, removing the need for manual correction, saving you time and also the hours. And perhaps you might be able to do, even do it in a Swedish hour uh, <laughs> using DVO frame lock. Um, but yeah, with that in mind, we are going to be releasing as well a little DVO uh, 
FrameLock user guide on the website soon. So keep an eye on that on the website and our socials. Uh, so if you are looking to uh, get into that, uh, that's there. And yeah, I think that is definitely right. It's also perfect for the Pepper Tunes as well, which would be very exciting. Oh, Timothy uh, has just jumped in with a question as well. Uh, can we please have Bjorn show us how to use recall function again? Are you able to do that quickly, Bjorn? I will do. Bear let with me. me. Uh, let me stop sharing may... my screen. Hold on. Uh, I don't want to promise too much. Let me see if I find uh, <laughs> uh, this one again, but I should be able to find it. I'm almost there. Bear with me. No problem, uh, so I'm going to go present, share screen. Yeah. Um, I think Bjorn, it would be interesting, uh, Timothy is asking about recall, actually show recall in the band, just in case someone wants to understand the differences. Yeah, well. yeah, uh, I will do so. So, so basically, uh, appending and recalling. Uh, so you can do it, uh, as I mentioned, uh, from, if I save the note, like uh, I've done here somewhere, if I go to notes, uh, so say that uh, I like this this shot to, uh, uh, and the settings for this one. Uh, I, all I need to do then is to store a note. I do it with this uh, small for small brackets or something. And once I have it there, I can select that note and I can see that I have a DBO frame lock in there. So I can then go to my next shot, uh, placing the header here, and recall it. Recall means I'm going to put it on exactly the same position as this one. So if I do recall, it will just replace the current one, but they were the same, so it's going to look the same. Uh, if I do append, uh, it will put it after. So now I suddenly have two DVO frame lock. I don't know why you want to have that, but it's possible to do. Um, and also, uh, you can also lasso in shots. So say for instance that I want to have that note applied on this one, or maybe on the, sorry, whole, the whole rest of it. So uh, I really want this one on all of these. So then I just recall, I press this rec uh, button and it puts it on the whole, all, all the things that I lassoed in. Uh, and of course, you can also not, you don't have to use uh, like notes, but uh, we have something very nice that we call events viewer. The events viewer show me actually every individual shot on the timeline. So I can go to whatever shot. I think this looks like, okay, this, this is the one I want to use. And uh, I can go onto this shot and tell it, uh, recall it onto this one. And it will place it. Oh no, I put it on everything. Um, uh, let me see. Frame lock. Let me. Maybe I have it. Um, oh, I had it already. So if I remove this one, so you can see something happening. So if I then go and tell it to use this one, recall on this current shot, it will put it there. Or if I lasso in a lot, I just recall it onto the whole everything that I selected. Control A will select the whole timeline and then you just get it. All the tools you selected will all go in there and uh, so on. So uh, what you have to remember though, input effects, uh, you have to select. Uh, uh, if nothing is selected, it will take anything from base and down. But if you want to record something from input effects, you physically have to select it. So I hope that answers your question. And just to add up to something here, so for example, you saw that Bjorn had the shot selected. Selection always takes precedence. So if you see that you have something orange on the timeline or if the box scroll bar on the actual interface is orange, that means something selected and you're doing your recall append to whatever is selected. So it's good to always make sure that the little bar that is not orange and if it is, just click on an empty space of the timeline section of the interface, and then it's going to recall to the shot where your timeline bar is actually parked on. Well, I hope that answers uh, your question, Timotei. And also, you know, are there any plans to renew the online manual for Phoenix? They are in the works. Uh, and as I think uh, if you missed it earlier on, Gus has uh, 
that one that there's a bit of an announcement for tomorrow, uh, not Thursday, sorry, for a bit of an update, which is very exciting, along with a new DVO tool. So stay tuned. Um, we also have another question from Justin, uh, who said, Bjorn, can you please elaborate how FrameLock tool uses the black square inside the gate to retrieve automated frame by frame stabilization? Uh, well, um, the way it works, it, it's going to look on uh, on every individual frame. Uh, and, and as it has the smart ROI, uh, it will find wherever your uh, uh, framing exists. And, uh, and then by uh, having a look on these, uh, it will sort of figure out where a good position of uh, the framing for that clip uh, would be. And, and uh, hence, it will then position all the frames accordingly. Well, you can remove, can't you, from different levels, the different margins, the top, bottom, middle, uh, well, left yes, and right. Uh, you can, and, and you can sort of, as I said, okay, take those two corners to to prefer it to sort of align it to that position mm. or something. So, uh, but... Uh, it just works, <laughs> I'm afraid. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and of course, not only corners, but as you probably saw in the interface when Bjorn was shown, you can actually define a region of interest as well. So if you want to define by pixels, make sure it's aligning to exactly where you want. Uh, you can also do that. Fantastic. That answers your question, Justin. Any other questions? I think we might have answered everyone. Well, brilliant. Well, anyway, I'd like to say again, Thank you, everyone, for jumping on the afternoon session of the Filmworks Classroom. Um, it's been a, another fantastic lesson. And I'd like to say again, thank you, Gus, for joining us. And of course, the man of the Swedish hour. We can use that as a time frame now. Bjorn, thank you so much for going through everything with us in great detail um, and showing us how to use the new DVO.